All right, so I just started the recording. Uh, again, today we're um, we're just doing a little recitation for things you need help with on the first project. So let's start off. We'll open for questions. Anybody stuck on something in particular? Okay, so you're stuck on the PCA transform. You guys here when we went over the PCA stuff? That was last Wednesday, correct? Yes. Yeah, we were here for that. Okay. Still so, kind of stuff. Gotcha. Um, for some reason, there we go. So let me go ahead and open up the PCA example. Uh, a quick question while you're working on that. Yes. Uh, as far as lists, I was trying to call something from my list, like uh, the zero list. Part of the list. Okay. And kept throwing an error saying I couldn't call from that. Like I was trying to run a for loop where it ran through each one of my very each okay. part of my list and right. did something with it, but it wasn't working like it would in say C plus plus. Okay. So you had a list like this, and then you were trying to have a for loop go through that list. Exactly. And Okay, so it was a list with some lists in it, or array, or you say arrays in it. Yeah, uh, I mean it was lists with I think lists in it. It's okay. Brackets. So here's a list with some lists in it. Okay, and then I'm going and let me do this. And do print len. X and that should be four that there's four lists in that list. So we run that. Oh, here. Let's just make sure it gives us there are four, right? So then if I loop through from zero up to the length of it, well one minus the length of it then we can print x the ith element. And so that should give us each of the four lists. So you're doing something like this and what you were getting an error? Yeah, I was trying to, but I, I don't know. I'll, I'll take a look at it again, but now I don't know how to set up the four properly. It'll probably work. Okay, so this, what this range function does is it re returns an array, I'm sorry, not an array, uh, uh, an object of the iterator class. I can't even remember what it is, but it's basically an iterator. It essentially gives you values from zero up to, but not including the integer that you pass in. So if you give it the length of x and length is four, it'll go from zero to three. Okay? So that's, you know, that's like the basic way of doing like a for loop you're used to in MATLAB or C. And you can change this. You can have it go from, you know, f you know, this goes from four up to eleven. Pretty sure it goes to eleven and not twelve. And then that goes up to four up to eleven in steps of two. So it's kind of like the colon operator in MATLAB. Okay. So have a look at that. That. Uh, and if you continue to have problems with a specific thing, let me know, and we'll we'll iron that out. Okay. So, um, yeah, this was all me being dumb and doing it all by scratch. But let's run this again. Let's see if I'm trying to remember what all this thing does. So, figure one, figure two, and figure three. So, Figure one's the original data. Figure two is when it's transformed into the direction of most variation, which it makes the x direction the direction of most variation. And then this is when it transforms it back, doing the inverse transform, getting back to the original data. So here's the original data, and you'll remember that the way all of these S scikit-learn functions are is that every row is a new data point and every column is a feature. So in this case data has 
50 data points and two features, an X and a Y position. Okay. Then I'm going to do, I'm going to create a PCA object and it's going to have two components, two features. You can use both of the two features. You can change that to one if you want to reduce the dimensionality down to a one dimensional space from the two dimensional space. But at least in this problem, we're wanting to work in two. Now, the data that you have has three dimensions. It has X, Y, and it has Z. When you're doing the PCA, you're not interested in the Z direction. Okay, you already know that it's going per perpendicular to the Z plane. So you're gonna throw, before you go to the PCA, you're gonna throw away all of the Z information because you're only trying to orient it in the X, Y plane. Okay, so you'll throw away the Z direction and you will only have two dimensional data to pass to the PCA, just your X and your Y because you'll be ignoring the Z. Okay, then this actually does the fit, does the actual uh, optimization of the k-means clustering. Okay, and so it'll modify where the centers are essentially. Okay, then the transform the data. So you pass in the original data. You could pass new data. You could pass whatever data you want. But right now I'm passing the original data, having it be transformed into the new space where you know we still you still have these two perpendicular directions, but they're no longer pointing x, x, and y. They're pointing in whichever direction the x makes it go in the direction of most variation. And then the y is just by default per perpendicular to that. Okay? So trans now has all of the data in the transformed space, okay? And you can see it's the same size. There's 50 data points and there's two features, but the feature values are going to be different because they've been rotated, okay? And then the inverse transform does the opposite, okay? You pass to it the information that is in the transformed data and then it'll give you back the reconstructed data and data and recon are the same thing and that's what we can see in figures one and figures three okay figure one's the original data figure three is the reconstructed data okay and then figure two is when it's been transformed okay and you see the big the direction of most variation is in the x-axis. So what you're going to be doing is, like I said, you're going to take your three-dimensional data, throw away the z stuff, just keep the x and y, use that to fit your PCA, and then in the, tra in this, in the transformed data points, you want to find what is the largest x, or what is the largest x, what is the smallest x, what is the largest y, what is the smallest y and you're going to want a bounding box. In this case, it's going to be a rectangle that's not rotated, okay? And so you're going to get these four points, the four points that are in those four positions, okay? Then you want to transform those four points back into the original space. So you're going to do your inverse transform, not on all the transform data, that'll just get you back to where you started, but you need to create, or one way to do this, is to create a four rows and two column NumPy array, where each row is, each, is one of the four corners of your bounding box. And each column is either the max x or the max min x or the max x and the min, uh, max y and the min y. All the combinations of the, the four combinations of the max and the min x's and y's. And then those four points get transformed back into the original space and those are now the four points that you want for your bounding box in the x, y, z. Okay, Where those are going to be four points with zero z values and then you're going to have another four points that are at the maximum of the z value of your cluster. So that's how you get your eight data points. Okay? And so then those eight data points, you want to draw lines between them to draw the outside of your bounding box. And drawing the lines uh, 
if you go and look at the lecture I just submitted this morning, <laughs> is what we covered on Friday on how to draw that with matplotlib, which is pretty simple. It's just like drawing them in MATLAB pretty uh, much. There's also a uh, plot dot rectangle where you have two corners and Okay. Is that in CV? That's open CV. I think it's in CV. Yeah. So you can plot the rectangles. Um, I'm not sure that's going to work for you because OpenCV is only going to be in two dimensions. And if I remember how that rectangle works, um, you pass to it the, an image and you pass where you want the rectangle to be and it actually changes the pixel values in that image so that the so that there is a rectangle drawn in the image it modifies an image here you don't have an image but rather you're trying to plot things in three dimensions so i don't think actually cv2 rectangle is going to work for you in this case but definitely when we do the um when we do the bounding boxes on the uh, face detection for the next project, I did use CV2 rectangle there. Yes? Uh, what are you thinking about it? Can you repost the camera PCA? The it, is it not there? The, the post is there, but it says the file associated with this content topic cannot be found. Uh-huh. Well, that's not good. I think... Yeah. That's right, it is not there now, is it? I think I had it in two places and then I moved, deleted it from one and it must have deleted it from both. Alright, it's there now, sorry. And when you notice stuff like that, send me an email and I can fix that pretty fast. Alright, so. You guys that were having some trouble with the uh, PCA, does that help at all? Uh, one other thing, like after we transform, basically by the max x and min x, max y, min y, and then transform only those points back into the. Right, so you're saying, so exactly, is that you get them in the transform space. And then, I mean, at least the way I'm thinking of doing it, you might do it a different way, but I'm thinking, okay, I've got all these points in my cluster, okay, and I want to find the bounding box, so really I'm just interested in the four corners. And so that's why I suggested creating an array with four rows, one for each of the four corners and two columns for the X and Y, and you transform just those four points back into the new space, and that tells you where the points are for the bounding box. You still, of course, need all of your other points and plot all of the three-dimensional points for that cluster, but really what you're shooting for is those bounding box yeah. corners. Yes? Well, the best way to do this for each individual cluster would be to call like, the individual clusters you made do this for that and then feed it back into the full data set? Right. So, yes. What I, what I would recommend is you have your, uh, there's what, six clusters, right? That's the correct number. So you have six clusters and like maybe you write a for loop to loop through each one of the clusters. That's you, what I was trying to do earlier. Yeah. So you have a, a, a loop that loops through all of your six clusters. So you'd use range six and that would go zero through five. And then you'll have each of your six six clusters and then you'll pull you'll have all of the data and then you will pull out which which of those data points represent that one particular cluster that I'm currently interested in and that's going to be you know that partial data is going to be what you're going to work with you'll plot that data in one particular color and then you'll strip away the z stuff take just the x and y fit your pca with that and then get your four points and transform them back and then you've got the four points for the bo bounding box for that cluster. And then your for loop will go through the next cluster, pull out all the data points that have to do with the second cluster, do that same thing and, and go through your loop that way. Is that what your, does that answer your question? Yes, Mark. Um, not for this, but um, the in your k-means clustering thing, um, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could explain your uh, for loop um, for the where you search to put the colors into the clusters. I don't know. This for loop here? Yes. Okay. So um, 
the k-means, you know, my k-means class, the one that is right here, or if you run this guy, which is the scikit-learn one. They're both made to work in the same way, where this cluster's object will have some data members. And one of the data members is labels underscore. Okay, and let me, let me go ahead and run this. So I've got all the pieces. And let me reset so I don't have all the old junk. Okay, run it again. All right. So cluster, where is the cluster? Do not have a cluster. Why is it not there? Did I get an error? Did it run? It did, it did run. Oh, clusters. There we go. Okay. So clusters has a bunch of different things, okay? Um, but one of the things it has is clusters underscore labels, uh, dot underscore labels. So this guy, clusters dot labels underscore. And what this is saying is which class, which cluster each of the input data represent. And you can see here there's 55 data points, okay? And so this means data point zero has class one. Class one, class one, class one. It's only the last five data points that are that cluster. And this is the case where there's mostly all in one and another. Okay? And so what it this what it's what the labels is saying is once I fit the data, it'll say of those data, which label does it re relate to? Okay? So that's what the uh, the labels underscore score is. So data itself, okay, is all of the data there, and you can see there's 55 rows and two columns. This is the X position, that's the Y position, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a Boolean array where I'm going to say, is the clusters.labels equal equal to either 0 or 1, okay? Because I'm going for I in range N. N is 2. So first it's going to be zero, then it's going to be one. Okay. So if I say labels underscore, those are all clusters dot labels underscore. Those are all the values. If I say when is that equal to zero, okay, that's going to now be a boolean array where I'm going to have falses where all the ones are and trues where all the zeros are. And if I did equal to one, it'd be the opposite. Okay. So. I'm now going to gosh why did I, I don't need numpy where do I I couldn't I just use logical indexing why did I make it complicated what is no, where, okay. where, where, where is uh, it's like find it's gonna return the indices where that oh. is tr where the boolean thing is true can't I just do logical indexing Maybe it doesn't work. I'm sorry. What's that? The way I the way I did that to separate each cluster to its own set of data, so it's individual, so you can transform it, was uh, say cluster zero is equal to data set uh, bracket label equals equals uh, zero or multiple by. Right. Which that's what I was getting at because right now I've used the NumPy where to get me the indices. But I think you can do like what you're doing, you're just doing direct um, logical indexing. Yeah, and it, it just takes all of that data and the out of the uh, data yeah. set and makes it one. I did that and I created a list out of those, so it doesn't win this Yeah, time. I did it in around, this is like the old, old MATLAB way before logical indexing existed. That's really strange. So yeah, I could simplify this down a lot. Oops. I don't know what I was thinking. I was like, let's make this complicated. It doesn't need to be complicated. This will work. It's simpler. But what to answer your question, Mark, what where does is if you pass to it 
So here's my logical. Let's do the other. Here's my logical uh, array of logicals. Right. And if I say numpy where that, it will return the indices where that is true. So that's the 50th, 51st, 52nd, 53rd, and 55th indices. Okay? And so what I had done before is I had numpy where tell me these are the numerical indices where it's true and then index those positions in data. But that's actually roundabout. I can just use logical indexing directly where I do this. Okay, what this says is, okay, I have my logical array of where it's equal to zeros and then I'm going to use logical indexing. So that's going to say take the value of data here, 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 and here. And those are the five data points that have the zeroth label. And that is the 50 data points that have the first label. Okay. So what I have now is this is all of the data points that have the ith label and then I'm saying take this zeroth elements out of them. Oh, it won't work, will it? Will it? I don't know. Maybe I did do that for a reason. Will that work? It doesn't work. I do have to do it the way I was going to do. It does have to be that way. Okay. So, what, was, what, what did the, the zero? I th the way I did it is the only way it's going to, well. Would it work if instead you said data clusters dot labels equals one comma zero? Or we do all the rows, the zeroth column. Maybe that will work. There we go. That's it. So what? That will work. Okay. Do you want me to explain the old way or this new way? Um, th this new the new way. Fine, okay. So, again, this guy here, that returns an array where there's five things that were labeled zero, and the first column is the x values, the second column is the y values. Okay? And to make this more understandable, let me store this in a temporary variable. So temp is 5 by 2. And now if I index give me all the rows but the zeroth column of temp, that gives me all of the x values. Now they're, 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 they're across, but you can see it's this value, this value, this value, this value, this value. Okay? And then this gives me all of the y values that are label 0. Okay? So let me just to double check on it close out all these figures and show that this is going to work again. It's invalid syntax because I don't need this parenthesis. There. Okay. So basically what I'm doing, I'm doing a bunch of things all in one in one command here. I'm extracting out the data which has to do with label i and getting its x stuff. Mm -hmm. And then here I'm extracting the stuff that's label i and getting its y stuff so that I can plot x versus y. Okay. okay. And then this plot command you have to send an array of x's, an array of y's, and then an optional parameter is the line type. And so I'm saying I don't want any line. I don't have a dash in there. If I did a dash, it would draw a line between the points. But instead, I'm just having a marker, a small dot, and I'm going to have the ith color, which when it's 0, it would be M, magenta. When it's 1, it will be C, cyan. And if I had more classes, it would do green, blue, and yellow. OK, does that answer your question on that for loop? Yes. OK. And so I don't know. You were saying you did it in a different way, pulling out. The, did, maybe what you're saying is that you had a list with 
all of the data points for each one of the classes yeah. that you you know because here I've left it all in one place and just when I need them I extract out the pieces I want but it sounds like you created a list with six elements in it and the first element was another list or an array of all the X and Y data points for that class that's, exactly what I've done. that's perfectly fine yeah I'm just having an Uh-huh. For each one and going through the transform and everything so that right. way I can have a separate list of like max X, min X, max Y, min Y. Sure. So that way I can go back in and draw the boxes. So you're trying to create a list with six elements for all these different things. Here's all the data points for the six ones. Here's all the max and min Ys for all the six things. Here's this all the centers for the all the six things. Yeah. So you just yeah. That sounds like a perfectly way, good way to it's just I'm do. Having trouble with that list. That okay. Well, let me, uh, you know, let me f answer any more questions we got here that might be good for everybody. And like last time on Friday, you know, we had some amount of time where I just well, come I'm around and help I you. Come back and work with you on that okay. Instead. Sure. Yeah, I mean. Um, I'm just trying to just start kind of trying to count on the uh, bottom of the box collection. Uh, I'm just trying to pick out uh, the different points or make right. sure that my differences uh, calculate sides instead of diagonals. All right, hold on. Let me open this link. You're, you're trying to follow this link in here, right? Yeah. Okay. So you're struggling with which part of this in here? Um, parsing out my box points into uh, getting the x across and the y down, but making sure that those aren't. Uh, So you've got your four points and you're having trouble labeling them upper left, upper right, lower right, lower left? Getting them in the right order? Uh, right. Is that right? Yeah, parsing out uh, what's what um, unless it's once they're transformed. Because you're saying that you're supposed to be looking at the, these, the difference between these two and you're looking at the difference between a diagonal is what's happening for you? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, but my guess, I'm trying to remember when I implemented this, my guess is that the upper right and upper left is probably not so important as long as you have them in the right order going, you know, around them, that you don't go diagonally across then the other one and then diagonally across. I think if you have them in the you know, either going clockwise or going cl counterclockwise, you should be okay. But I'm not sure about that. I I don't remember how I did it. Um, but you know, if you wanted to be really safe, you know, if you know which one is the max, you can find out which one has the largest y and the largest x. You know, what are the two? What are the two that have the largest y's? And you make that the upper side. And then whichever one has the smallest x, you make that the left. I don't think I don't recall doing that myself, so I don't think that's necessary as long as you ha just don't go across the diagonal in the way you order them. But yeah, I can see that being tricky. Did anybody get this to work? The bounding box collision. Inconsistently. Inconsistently. Um, I'll have. To to go back and look and see how I did that, but um, I don't know that I did it the same way though, because I actually wound up finding a, um, a tutorial based on just polygons instead of uh, rectangles. Okay. So I used um, projecting on two vectors normal to each side of each polygon. So you sound like you found a more general one than the rectangles. Essentially, this does the same thing. It just right. Yeah, this is just a special case of that one because this is four points instead of five or six or whatever general one you, you found. And this is a little tricky because it, you know, it has all these you know linear algebra dot products and and you can go through this and really understand it if you want, 
Okay, but in the end, you can really just follow the equations and you know which is the upper right, which is the lower right, left, and do the dot products. You know, if you just follow the equations, it'll work out. Um, but it is really interesting how you know they derived this and they that they're you know that it's proven that it's going to give you the the intersections, which are kind of neat. One thing I do run into trouble with using this is like whenever I have the clusters in five, they don't always cross over each other. They don't, you're right. So he has a he has uh, some images here of going through two clusters, three clusters, four clusters, five clusters, six, and seven. And so he's right that on, if you have too few clusters, you may not get, there may not be any collisions because here the, the pedestrian and one of the cars is lumped together as a cluster, okay? And so what you need to do is you need to increase, keep increasing until you have no overlap. And then you keep increasing until you then get overlap again. And then you know you've gone too far. Okay? So it's, you sort of have to be checking two things at once. Okay? You increase the number and eventually you should get no overlap at some point. Okay? And as you keep increasing at some point, you will get overlap because you're splitting something that shouldn't be split. So you have to have sort of, when I wrote it, I had two flags. One flag for, do I have no overlap yet? And once I, have, and once I don't have overlap, then I'm checking another flag, do I have overlap again? Cool. Okay? So, you know, that, that's, that is normal. Sweet. That's cool. You can go and check out Justin's. That's a really good example for where you're where you're going to be headed. So you've got the oh, you've got those figures, but you don't have the the collision working yet. Yeah, I don't have right. the collision. Right. Okay. Well, let me go ahead. Let me open up mine and just. So I'm just, right, that's the axis, yeah, because there's these axis values, they're the different sides, right, you have to take the difference, it's pretty, you know, if you follow all that stuff just the way it is, it's not all that complicated, you know, once you understand and get everything down, so, yeah, they define these these axis stuff. Let's see, where do they define the axis? And now wait a minute, this isn't right. I'm recording this. <laughs> How am I going to do this now? Do I even going to need to go through and uh, put like a, a box over that? <laughs> Just post it. It'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to do some some editing or something. Your well, yes, of course it is. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I was thinking I don't mind showing you some of the stuff there, but if you have an inf infinite amount of time to look at it, um, that was kind of silly. Um, so let's see, where's the, where are they defining the axes here? Right there, in that bowl, in that very. In here. Yeah. Ah, okay. So you got the upper right and the upper right. X's, so axis, okay. So those are the four sides. So that's side one, the difference in X for side one, then the difference in Y for side one, then the, boy, they should put commas or something in here. Then the difference in X for side two, difference in Y for side two. So basically, you're, you're looking at the difference in X for each of the four sides and the difference in Y for each of the four sides. And like I said, I didn't pay any attention to which was upper left, which was upper right. I just, when I made my bounding box, I made sure they went around in either counterclockwise or clockwise order. And then I made sure it went that way because you're trying to do sides and sides and sides and sides. So that axis is supposed to have the four sides. So this one comes back. 
Yeah, here you've got upper right. Upper right. Why is that upper left? This one looks like the same thing. What's that? Okay. Upper right. Oh, right, the A and the B. Right, gotcha. So there's the four sides for each of the two objects. So the axis is basically just the distance across each side for X's and Y's. So then, I guess in this notation they're using dot to be scalar multiplication and times to be vector multiplication. Let's see, because a dot u r, that is a vector, right? Right? That's what a dot u r is. Where do they say that? Yeah, a dot u r is a vector. Ah, and you get that. You get that from the axes, right? Is that how it works? I think a dot u r is just the x and y points of the upper right corner. Yeah, that's what I thought. Projection of a dot u r. That's got to be a vector. The projection of that along this axis. So a dot u r has to be a vector. Projection of rectangle a's upper right corner. Onto axis one. So you're saying you think this is just this is a point? The upper right point does sort of see that way. Okay, so maybe axis one is the axis one is the vector. Axis right. Okay. Axis one is the vector. See because AX1, this guy here, that's the difference in X between these two points. And then axis 1, Y is the difference between those two points in Y. And so axis 1, so this thing together, this thing together defines the axis 1 vector, which is the vector pointing in the direction from the upper left corner to the upper right corner. So that's a vector. Then we're trying to project that on the point. So this is a point with an x and y, like you say, Justin. And this is a vector with an x and a y. So that is the dot product between those two vectors. Right. Yes. Construct as a vector. So here's zero zero. So upper right. This is the vector upper right that goes from the origin to that point. And then axis one is this vector. Right. Now that one should give 
zero because the projection of a point that's on the axis should give zero. Right. And then if we had a different case where we have this vector, that's what? That's lower left. The projection of this vector onto that should give you this distance. So when the projection of upper right onto axis 1, that should be 0 because the point lies on the vector. So that's one way to check that your stuff's working right is that if you get if you do the dot product between those two, then you'll get that. Which, I don't know, did I? I don't think I did that. Yeah, I just did the dot product. Or did I? Oh, no, the top is the dot. You have to dot the top. You use the dot product here, and then you do have to divide by the magnitude. Now this is going to give you another vector. Because this is going to give a scalar. The denominator is a scalar. And then if I multiply by axis 1, axis 1 is a vector. So that's going to give me another vector. OK, but then they've broken it into its x and y components that's the amount of, you know, that's how much from here to here is in x and there to there in y. Right. So they just expanded out the dot product here of that numerator. And then that's the x portion and that's the y portion. The x and the y coordinates of a u are projected onto that example. Right, OK. So that gives you the x and the y positions projected onto there. Oh, that gives you this point. Yeah, OK. So that's what you get. Right, this thing right here, this value right here, and this value right here are the x and the y positions of that point on that axis. must be. Okay, so then what do you do with those two points? So that's the projection here. Right. So you get a bunch of these points. So doing all the combinations of these give you a bunch of points along the line of that axis. And then this and then we find the lar biggest and smallest values for where are the ones on the ends.
so we get the projection, the two projections. Right, I did what he's at what he suggested was doing the dot product between the two things. Right. Gosh, I should have it's been a while since I looked at this. Okay. All right, so these guys, we know how to calculate these numbers. So you've got one axis and then you find all of the so you take one you choose one axis and then you get all of the other and then you have eight points so for any one axis you take all of the other eight points and find out where they fall on okay now interestingly enough these two points because it's a rectangle your, those two points will map, they'll project to the same point. So if you've done all this right and you take all of your eight points, it's only, it, it will give you eight values, but you'll only have one, two, three, four, five, six. Ah, right, because the one, this square that you had, the, the rectangle that you had the axis on will only give two points. And the other rectangle that's not in the same direction, that will give you all four points. So you'll, if you put it on all four, on all eight points, you'll only get six that are unique. So again, that's a good way to check. So if you choose one of one axis, you choose one axis, and you'll get six points. Okay, so you'll get six values that have x and y positions. All right. So that's what you'll get for any given side. Then we need to get scalar values to identify the maximum minimum projections of the vectors. The simplest and cheapest is to take the dot product of the vectors with the x-axis. And that's really basically throwing away the y values. Because because all these point all those points fall along a line, you just want to know where they are relative to each other. So you can say, oh well, this one's smaller in x, smaller in x, smaller in x, smaller in x. If as you go across, or you can go smaller and y, smaller and y, smaller and y, smaller and y. So actually, if you just throw away either the x or the y, you'll get the order of where they fall. So you don't have. I mean. Taking the dot product with the x-axis is really just throwing away the y information. Okay, so basically, even though you calculated two values for this, you're only really keeping one. Okay, so then you've got a scalar value rather than a point. Rather than the x and y point, you need a scalar value how far along the line is, and the magnitude doesn't matter; just the relative positions. All right, so then we need to look if, so you've got at this point, huh, excuse the pun, you have two points corresponding to the A rectangle and you have four points for the B rectangle. And you're going to check is the A, so where's the minimum of A? Basically, you want to look for the minimum and maximum of A, and if any of the B's fall in between the minimum and maximum of A, then you know you have collision. So if the smallest of B is less than the smallest of A, you've got an overlap, and, it, and if the maximum of B here, the largest B, is greater than the minimum, then you've got an overlap. But basically, what you're looking for is to see if any of the values of B fall in between the values of A. You have two values of A, and if any of the B's fall in between those two, then there's overlap. Okay? And so that's, so we just talked about how to do it for one of the four sides. Then you have to do it for all the other, the other three sides. Okay? So that is a little tricky.